So welcome everybody. This is Southport's Armchair History from the Southport Historical Society and I'm Liz Fuller. And um, we want to thank the Friends of the Library and Harper Library for um, helping us publicize this event. So, um, so just this past August, it seems longer ago than that, but just this past August, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. But the story of American women working to secure their rights didn't end with just obtaining the vote. In fact, that was just the beginning of women's fight for equality. So this month, we're going to pick up the story 50 years later by talking about the second wave of feminism, which occurred in the 1960s and 1970s. So I'm sure most of you recognize the women on this slide. Four of them are the only women in U.S. history to have run on a major party presidential ticket. All five are historic groundbreakers. So on the right, we have Shirley Chisholm and Hillary Clinton. So in 1968, Ms. Chisholm became the first black woman to be elected to the United States Congress. And in 1972, Congresswoman Chisholm became the first black candidate to run for a major party's nomination for president of the United States. Although she did not get the nomination, she came in fourth among the candidates, receiving 152 delegate votes and finishing ahead of nine white male candidates. Below her on the slide is Hillary Clinton, whom I'm sure we all recognize. Clinton became the first woman to be nominated for president of the United States by a major political party when she won the Democratic Party nomination in 2016. She was also the first woman to win the popular vote in an American presidential election, which she lost to Donald Trump. On the left, we have Geraldine Ferraro, first female vice presidential nominee representing a major American political party. She served in the United States House of Representatives from 1979 to 1985, and in 1984 was the Democratic Party's vice presidential nominee running alongside former Vice President Walter Mondale. She was also an ambassador, an attorney, a journalist, an author, and a businesswoman. And below her is Sarah Palin. Palin was the first Republican female vice presidential nominee and the second female vice presidential nominee of a major party after Geraldine Ferraro. She was also the ninth governor of Alaska from 2006 until her resignation in 2009. And in the center is Kamala Harris, who is the third female vice presidential nominee of a major political party. She's also the first black woman and the first Asian American woman to hold that position. She is currently the Democratic Party's vice presidential nominee running alongside former Vice President Joe Biden. In the 2015 Senate election, Harris became the second black woman and the first South Asian American to serve in the United States Senate. So as I said, all of these women were groundbreakers. And even though none of them won their presidential or vice presidential races, at least not yet, they still succeeded in changing history. They took on roles that women had never held before. And despite blatant sexism, and in some cases racism, they forced the patriarchal establishment to take them seriously. And they encouraged more women to enter politics and to take on leadership roles. So these five women made history on the national level, but none of them could have accomplished what they did without the work of other not so well-known women who worked on the local levels. These women worked diligently to get their voices heard, to break their own barriers and to secure women's rights. So today we're gonna to talk about one of these women, Margaret Taylor Harper, born and raised right here in Southport. She was a groundbreaker in women's rights. In 1968, she became the first woman in North Carolina to run for statewide public office. And this is the story of her campaign. So most of us that are on the call today were also around in 1968. And it doesn't seem so much like history when we can remember it, right? But I bet there are things that we've forgotten about 1968, especially when it comes to women's rights. So as a refresher, in 1968, a woman was not allowed to get a credit card in her own name. It wasn't until 1974 that a law forced credit card companies to issue cards to women without their husband's or father's signature. In 1968, women could be fired for getting pregnant. That wasn't changed until the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978. 
And in 1968, women were not allowed to get an Ivy League education. Yale and Princeton didn't accept female students until 1969. Harvard didn't admit women until 1977 when it merged with the all-female Radcliffe College. Brown didn't admit women until 1971, Dartmouth not until 1972, and Columbia University didn't admit women until 1981. In 1968, a woman couldn't sue for sexual harassment in the workplace. The first time a court recognized sexual harassment in an office setting was 1977. In 1968, women couldn't get health insurance at the same monetary rate as men. Sex discrimination wasn't outlawed in health insurance until 2010, and it's still something that is periodically debated. In 1968, women in North Carolina under the age of 21 could not purchase birth control. That was changed in 1971 to the age of 18. It's estimated that in 1967, 829,000 abortions were performed in the United States. And the majority of those were performed illegally in unsafe conditions because Roe v. Wade was not decided by the Supreme Court until 1973. In 1968, a married woman had no choice about having sex with her husband. Marital rape was not identified as a crime in all 50 states until 1993. In fact, North Carolina was one of the last states in the Union to criminalize marital rape. There were laws about domestic violence, or wife beating, as it was then called, but they were insufficiently enforced. The courts tended to treat domestic abuse as a private matter between a married couple and not a punishable crime. And women had a more difficult time divorcing their husbands. They had to show evidence of sufficient grounds for divorce, such as adultery, abandonment, or the commission of a felony. Otherwise, they could be denied a divorce by the courts. The first no-fault divorce law was enacted in California in 1969. New York, the final state to enact a no-fault divorce law, didn't do so until 2010. So in 1968, there were many mothers who told their daughters to be sure and let the man win when playing sports or games so as to preserve their egos. But the law took it even further. Women were not allowed to compete with men in the Boston Marathon until 1972. So these pictures are from the Boston Marathon in 1967. You see this woman had registered um, and was running when one of the officials realized that she was a woman and that's the man in black and he's trying to pull her out of the race as she's running and said, not on my watch, a woman's not gonna run. The man who is tussling with him is her boyfriend who was running next to her. In 1968, it was still legal to list jobs by sex, help wanted male or help wanted female. This practice didn't end until the mid 1970s and only after being challenged all the way to the Supreme Court. Women earned about 59 cents per every dollar that men earned versus today when women earn about 81 cents per dollar that men earn. There were many occupations that were closed to women either by law or by custom. So the career opportunities open to women were hmm. limited. So I remind you of all of this to help you remember how challenging it was to be a woman in 1968, how many barriers were still unbroken and how many roles women were still not allowed to play. And it was in this environment in which Ms. Harper decided to run for Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina. So at that time in North Carolina, only one candidate was running for Lieutenant Governor, Speaker of the House Hoyt Patrick Taylor. He was a career politician. And Margaret Harper and her husband Jim didn't feel it was appropriate that Taylor should run unopposed. So the day before the deadline, the filing deadline, Margaret drove up to Raleigh and she submitted her name to run. The next day, on the very last day, a third candidate, Frank M. Matlock submitted his nomination. And to Taylor's surprise, he suddenly found himself in a three-way race. So, okay, that is not a picture of Frank M. Matlock. I couldn't find a picture of him, no matter how hard I looked. And so that's Andy Griffith playing a fictional character named Matlock. If anybody knows of where I can get a picture, please let me know. So just like today, the Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina is an elected position that is run separately from the governor position. 
So like current Governor Cooper and Lieutenant Governor Forrest, the two positions can even be of separate parties. But unlike today, in 1968, being Lieutenant Governor was only a part-time position. But it still paid pretty well. The salary was $5,000 a year, and at the time, the median full-time salary for men was $7,700 a year, so almost a full-time salary. And the median full-time salary for women was $4,500 a year, so this part-time job paid more than most women made working full-time. Margaret's last-minute decision to run for public office threw Pat Taylor off balance. One minute, he was running on a pose, and the next, he was running against an unknown opponent who also happened to be a woman. He stated, I don't like to have anyone run against me, but running against a woman, it's hard to know what to think about it. It's kind of like getting into a prize fight with a woman. He added that many people told him not to worry about Harper as an opponent, but he said, I look upon political opponents like a heart attack. There's no such thing as one that's not serious. And just as her opponent struggled how to handle her, so did the media. Margaret's gender was a double-edged sword. On one hand, being a woman in a man's race meant that she was not taken seriously as a candidate. On the other, it meant that there was a public fascination for everything that she did, which gave her more coverage than some of the other candidates. The press had a tendency to discuss Margaret's appearance, something they didn't do with the male candidates. In almost every article, they seemed compelled to describe her physically. They referred to her as an attractive lady who was pretty, vivacious and gracious, and who added femininity and friendliness to everything that she does. They also commented on the clothes she wore. In one instance, they took the time to describe her sleeveless white dress with a matching full length coat that they said looked pretty with her gray hair. They pointed out that while she had not made these particular clothes, she did make a lot of her own clothes. They also mentioned that she was a wife, a mother, and a grandmother who had the full support of her husband and sons to run for public office. Now, if you attended the class I did on the 19th Amendment, you might remember that during that period, there was a lot of unpleasant talk that the only women who wanted the right to vote were ugly old maids who aspired to be like men. So taken in the best light, the media's focus on Harper's attractive appearance and her feminine accomplishments and her role as wife and mother might have been a way to forestall criticism that she was unfeminine. But taken another, this focus on her traditional feminine qualities was a way to diminish her credentials and make her seem less credible and less serious. But Ms. Harper was not about to be dismissed as just a pretty face. On one occasion, she attended a public forum where all three candidates would have the opportunity to speak. When Pat Taylor stood up to speak, he glanced over at Margaret and then turned to the crowd telling them, I sure hope this race isn't decided on looks. The crowd laughed, Margaret didn't. She said, he's gonna have to do better than that. On the other hand, Margaret's novelty as a woman did continue to get her more press than if she'd been a male candidate. Margaret said, being the first woman to run for Lieutenant Governor is in itself newsworthy. It's treated me to a lot of publicity that I couldn't buy. Unfortunately, there was a tendency for the public to want to treat her public appearances a bit like the performance of a dancing bear. The marvel is not that the bear dances well, but that the bear dances at all. Harper had no backing from any political faction. She and her husband, Jim, completely funded her campaign themselves. This gave her the advantage of not being obligated to any person or obligation, organization. Margaret stated that one of the things I want very earnestly to prove is that you don't have to be independently wealthy or get financial backing to be elected in this state. Margaret didn't participate in any major political events. She said they weren't her style. However, she did travel to every corner of the state, speaking at every gathering that would have her. She continued to focus on her goal, which was to lead women's movement for better government. She felt that women already knew who she was, so she focused on getting in front of as many men's groups as possible. She went every place that a man would go with no barrier because of her gender. She shook hands in barber shops and country stores and spoke before men's civics club, civic clubs and political rallies. She said that after getting over their initial surprise, the men treated her campaign very warmly. Margaret used her lack of political experience to her advantage. 
One of the main functions of the lieutenant governor position was to assign committee membership. She asserted that being a political novice with no political debts would lead to better appointments to committees because she would base them solely on merit rather than political indebtedness. She said, I would see that there is a fair hearing on all the issues. I would not stack any committees for or against any issues. Going in unencumbered offsets some of the advantages my opponents can point to. And just because Margaret didn't have political experience doesn't mean she wasn't qualified for the job. The main role of the Lieutenant Governor is to preside over the 50 men of the State Senate. Margaret had presided over much larger conventions in her three decades of club work. In Southport, we think of her five terms as president of the Southport Women's Club, but she also served two years as the president of the North Carolina Federation of Women's Clubs and two more years as president of the North Carolina Council of Women's Organizations. She was also active in national federation work and this experience gave her confidence that she would be able to help the state legislature work together. One of her strongly held convictions was that sensible people sitting down together can solve their problems. So on this picture, you see this photograph, you see Margaret Harper on the left in a lovely dress that she probably made herself. And then in the middle, uh, we see Jessie Taylor, who's Margaret's mother, and um, who is a very interesting person in her own right. These are all former presidents of the women's organization. And uh, next month, we'll be talking about Jessie Taylor in detail and her work during Hurricane Hazel. So Margaret was particularly interested in the fact that being Lieutenant Governor would automatically give her a position on the State Board of Education. She said, I intend to be a leader for education. She felt strongly that there should be at least one woman on the Board of Education. She said, with women being 76% of educators, it's strange that there's no woman on the board. And besides her club work, Margaret had served in a number of district and conference offices for the Methodist Church and in organizations with special interest in library, continuing education, mental health, and traffic safety. She'd been a member of the Governor's Commission on Library Resources and served as Vice Chairman of North Carolinians for Better Libraries and on the State Beautification Commission. So you might recognize this picture where it's being taken. This the library off to the side, right behind the stage, that's our library building. And this is the dedication of the library. That's Margaret sitting on the stage and with the audience sitting on folding chairs in the middle of Moore Street. And of course, eventually, uh, not at that time, but eventually the library would be named after Margaret and her husband, Jim Harper. So with all of that committee work, it's hard to imagine that Margaret had time for anything else. But since her graduation from Greensboro College in 1937, she had run the Stevens Insurance Agency, a company that had been founded by her grandfather in 1883. And then during World War II, when her husband was away in the war, she had actually stepped in to run her husband's newspaper, the State Port Pilot. When Jim left, he told her that if the bank account ever got below $500 to just shut it down, but in fact, she ran the newspaper very successfully, never missing a weekly issue. Following the war, she became a charter member of the North Carolina Press Women, serving as president. And over the years, she continued to be the bookkeeper for the State Port Pilot. This, these pictures are from a booklet that um, the North Carolina Press Women put together uh, with little biographies of each um, person that was in there so that they could network better and get to know each other better. And Margaret, wrote quite a bit of it, so she had to write her own little bio. And so she wrote, um, Margaret Taylor Harper, Mrs. James M. of Southport, who had a newspaper dumped in her lap when the war came along. While husband Jim has been in the Navy, she's been keeping the state port pilot and an insurance agency going. She served as Eastern District Chairman, Vice President, and then President of the NCPW, North Carolina Press Women. Margaret finds a column the hardest thing to write, including editorials. She does, does about everything there is to be done on the paper and now has an efficient helper in her young son, Jimmy, who's seven years old. Seems silly to be writing about yourself in the third person. So I like that because it also shows Margaret's sense of humor. She was also very involved in the Methodist Church. She was the organist, the choir director, and she taught Sunday school classes. She was a member of the Democratic Party. However, the party had evolved over the years in what it stood for. And just like today, there was a continuum of conservative to moderate to liberal all within the same party. And people were naturally curious as to where in that continuum Margaret stood. So she shied away from attaching herself to any one wing of the Democratic Party. But when she was pressed, she told the following story. She said, 
She'd once heard of a man who had been widowed twice. He buried both of his wives in the local cemetery. When he was asked where he would like to be buried, he replied, just put me in the middle, but lean me a little toward Tilly. Margaret said, I lean a little toward the liberal wing, but just a little. Progress in North Carolina has not come through the extremes. Despite her last minute entry, her lack of experience and her gender, Margaret was optimistic about her chances in the election. She said, I think I've got a pretty good chance, an extremely good chance. She felt people were looking for a different approach to government, a movement away from professional politicians. She said, I want to offer a change within the Democratic Party. North Carolina is in a state of change. We are in a lot of trouble if we don't work for this new approach. Margaret's husband, Jim Harper, who by that time had had a front seat view of Margaret's abilities for over 30 years, was also enthusiastic about her campaign. He said, I believe this is a year when a woman can be elected, and I believe Margaret Harper is the one for the job. Despite the Harper's optimism, Margaret did not win the Democratic nomination for Lieutenant Governor in 1968. She did, however, garner over 21% of the vote and carry five counties, which was a pretty strong showing for a first-time candidate. Following her loss, she joined forces with Pat Taylor and the Democratic Party to get him elected. Margaret believed her candidacy would at least encourage more participation by women in politics from registering to vote to seeking office. She said, I want women to be involved in politics. I've encouraged women to run for public office. This is not a new position for me. 1968 was the start of a turbulent time in US history. Margaret's election race ended in March, 1968. One month later, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated which led to four days of widespread violence leading to the deaths of 13 people and the arrests of over 6,000. Two months after that, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated while campaigning for presidency. It had been fewer than five years since his brother JFK had been assassinated in Dallas. The country was reeling. The following year in 1969, the US started a lottery for the draft of soldiers into Vietnam. This was supposed to make the draft more equitable, but there were many who questioned the fairness of it and the outrage of the war only increased. Across the country, anti-war protests spread and the women's liberation movement had begun to gain popularity. Women began to form their own protest marches demanding equal rights with men. In the midst of this chaos, the United States landed on the moon. And I only mention that to underscore that as a nation, we had figured out how to send men to the moon a full six years before we figured out how to give women a line of credit without having their husband or father co-signing for them. Now, during, during all of these turbulent years, Margaret Harper continued her public service roles, even taking on new responsibilities. She became the vice chairman of the North Carolina Democratic Party and speculation began as to whether she would run for Lieutenant Governor again. In 1970, Harper attended the Governor's Committee on State Government Reorganization. And at that meeting, a committee member made a recommendation that the Lieutenant Governor position be expanded from a part-time to a full-time position. And the rationale was that if the Lieutenant Governor were a full-time officer, he might help the Governor with the affairs of the state. Harper, who of course had run for the Lieutenant Governor position two years earlier, suggested that instead of the word he, the phrase should be changed to the person holding the office uh, might help the governor. She said, after all, it's entirely possible that it could be a woman instead of a man holding the position. The men all chuckled and one committee member then asked her whether that meant she was planning to announce her candidacy for Lieutenant to Governor again, but she just smiled. The following year, Harper attended a meeting of the North Carolina press women where she had been a founding member and past president. To these women who had seen her leadership abilities firsthand, she admitted that she was considering another run for Lieutenant Governor. She said, I'm still interested in it because I think the number two spot is a good place for a woman. I think that even the men feel women should be given a part in state government. I may run. Shortly after Harper's admission to the press women, she presided over a state democratic women's convention where Shirley Chisholm was the guest speaker. Congresswoman Chisholm was preparing to launch her own bid for the Democratic nomination for president. Chisholm spoke to the women about not waiting to be asked to participate in politics. Chisholm said, 
If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And that tremendous amounts of talent are lost to our society just because that talent wears a skirt. And finally, you don't make progress standing on the sidelines, whimpering and complaining. You make progress by implementing ideas. Chisholm was not just an inspiring speaker. She was a living example of the words she was speaking. Her goddaughter recalls she had guts and she made people believe that they too can be someone, that we are equal, that gender doesn't mean you can't achieve the highest office of government. According to one attendant at the North Carolina Women's Convention, Chisholm's speech appeared to light a fire in the women who were there. She said, it was incredible how those upper middle class matrons turned into some new kind of militant when she made her talk. She didn't harangue or scream. She just talked about simple things like peace and school lunches. Before, we had talked about how to organize coffee hours or mail letters. She turned us on to issues and the true role of women in politics. She said, I don't think any of the candidates should ignore that force this year. They better not. Margaret Harper, who presided at that meeting, had her own message for Democratic candidates for governor. She told them frankly that lip service to women would not be enough in 1972. Shirley Chisholm wrote an autobiographical book called Unbought and Unbossed, which was her 1968 campaign slogan. The phrase referenced the fact that she was not beholden to anyone else politically. The same could be said for Margaret Harper, who having paid for her own campaigns had no political ties or indebtedness. In November of 1971, Harper, like Chisholm, was considering launching another campaign. It's likely Chisholm's words resonated with her and perhaps encouraged her own ambitions. Three months later, in February of 1972, Harper announced her second run to be the Democratic nominee of Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina. Margaret borrowed her own campaign slogan from the popular magazine, The Ladies Home Journal, never underestimate the power of a woman. Despite the progress that had been made by the women's liberation movement, or perhaps because of it, Harper once again found that there was a great deal of interest in the details of her personal life. Rather than being asked to discuss her views on issues, she found herself being questioned about her home life. She told reporters that it had been over 12 years since she had had a maid. She said, Jim and I like to go home from the paper together. We don't think there is any such thing as a man's job or a woman's job. We do everything together. Ours is a partnership all the way. So this building, this picture is of a building that uh, used to stand on the corner of Howe and Moore Street. And on the left-hand side, you see it says the State Port Pilot. And on the right, it says the Stevens Agency, which is the insurance agency that her uh, grandfather started in 1883. So I like to imagine them walking to work in the morning and going into the offices and talking and working and maybe going out to lunch and then walking home together because they lived close by. So I'm assuming that's the way it happened. Um, when asked how she manages tasty meals after a day at the paper, she said she prepares ahead of time. I peel piles of shrimp and put them in my freezer along with steaks. While I'm looking at television, I shell walnuts and put them in the freezer for desserts. When I get home, I just pull things out of the freezer and make a good meal. Harper also mentioned that she had been making her own clothes since she was 12 years old. Until two years ago, she still made all her own clothes, including her coats, two years before the campaign. She said since campaigning, she still sews, but not as much. She did mention that campaigning had not kept her from needle pointing covers for all her dining room chairs, a project she had only recently finished. So this is a picture of her home that was on the corner of Bay and Howe Street. So just one block over from where she, from where they worked. Um, one reporter went so far as to ask her whether a woman could be a politician and still be feminine. Harper didn't hesitate in her response. She said, sure she can. She doesn't have to talk coarse or act like a man to get her point across. Efficiency, integrity, intelligence, these are the qualities for public service and there's no gender to them. Women don't want to shove aside men. They simply want to share the responsibilities of citizenship. There's so much that needs to be done. I don't want to sit down and not help. The election this time was more hotly contested. There were five candidates for Lieutenant Governor. And part of this was due to the fact that the role itself had changed. It was now a full-time position with the 
salary of $30,000, which was three times higher than the median income for men and five times higher than the median income for women working full time. So in the intervening four years, the country had changed, the role of the Lieutenant Governor had changed, and in some ways, Margaret Harper had changed. She still ran her campaign on her own terms, but this time she was more vocal about her positions on issues. Harper's family and friends made sacrifices to support her campaign. She and Jim sold some land in Brunswick County to finance her campaign, which was almost entirely self-funded. Her son, Ed, left his job as a reporter in Whiteville and came home to run the state port pilot while she and her husband were hitting the campaign trail. Church friends filled in her, for her roles as organist, choir director, and Sunday school teacher. Her husband, Jim, acted as her campaign coordinator and advance man. He said, his wife doesn't perform best when she has just one thing to do, but give her four or five jobs and she does them all well. Margaret Harper said that her campaign was a true partnership with her husband and that she had never felt closer to him than during that time. The state headquarters of Margaret's campaign was located right here in Southport. She had a full-time campaign manager and a few high school volunteers. So in this picture, you see one of her high school volunteers dressed up in the red and white uniform that they uh, wore and wearing her um, sash. And they would wear these uniforms when they would go um, with Margaret um, on campaign trips and they would carry baskets with uh, campaign buttons and pass out buttons with, um, with Margaret Harper for Lieutenant Governor on them. And then on the right, you can see a close up, um, a little bit more of the sash and uh, a poster for Margaret Harper's campaign and also this photograph. Her campaign was definitely streamlined com as compared to her opponents, where they had large staffs and they traveled to meetings via airplane or helicopter. Margaret's approach was simpler. She had a green Oldsmobile with her name and pictures plastered on the door, and when she wasn't driving herself, Jim was her chauffeur. Harper had firm ideas on education. She was a trustee for the North Carolina Wesleyan College. She said, I want daycare centers. I want to see an end to discrimination against women in education and an end to arbitrary quotas on the number of women students accepted to schools. And that wasn't a quota of the maximum number, I mean, the minimum number of women accepted to a school. It was a quota on the maximum number of women. Harper uh, quoted Elizabeth Kuntz, the first African-American president of the National Education Association and director of the United States Department of Department of Labor Women's Bureau, who was also from North Carolina. Kuhn said, we are not asking for control of the world or of the country. We are asking for control of our own lives. Margaret Harper said, we must establish ourselves as human beings qualified to make suggestions, carry out programs and be in public office. Harper said, years ago, women got the right to vote and thought the battle was won when we got it but all we got was the right to participate. We need to go to the logical channel of involving women in government. We now have to do some of the things that should have been done in the 1920s. Women make up 51% of the population, yet less than 1% of elected offices are held by women. We have fewer women in elected office today than we had 10 years ago. During her campaign, the Equal Rights Amendment was coming up for a vote in the Senate. When asked about the pending amendment, Harper noted that there is already the machinery for equal rights in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and existing constitutional amendments. She said the ERA should not have become necessary, but it has. The Supreme Court has not used the machinery it already has. Harper distanced herself from the controversies of the women's liberation movement, which was seen as being run by women who were radical, extremist, unfeminine, and most likely lesbians. But Harper did embrace the message behind the movement. She said, I ran for this office in 1968. And at that time, my identity as a woman may have been a liability, but this time it's a plus factor. The women's liberation movement has changed the climate and put the spotlight on women. I'm not a member of the women's liberation movement, but I do recognize the group's contribution in bringing about the realization that women are due for a change and are more capable than previously thought. She said, women have labored under prejudicial treatment too long. Women's liberation has highlighted the dilemma we find ourselves in. While I'm not a women's liberationist and disagree with their methods, 
I am in complete sympathy with some of their goals. For instance, it's unthinkable that women and men should work side by side at the same job and be paid unequally. I want to bring women's salaries up to the level of men, not men's salaries down to the level of women. Mrs. Harper quoted statistics showing that of the increase in the labor force between the years 68 and 70, 57% were women. That just highlighted the fact that the average salary for women is less than the average salary for men. She said, we have to work harder and do a better job. Are we working women satisfied with lower paying jobs or are we being put into lower paying jobs? She said, the women who have earned their places in business, industry, and public office have had to sneak by all these prejudices. She said, men still think that women are not serious about a vocation. She called attention to the prejudice of employers in hiring women. They think we are just marking time until marriage or working to earn a little extra money. And they say that women are not as steady workers as men. She said, it's just not so. Many women work because they have to. And labor department st statistics prove yet there's less absenteeism among women than men. In assessing women's attitudes toward political life, Harper cited women who did not enter politics because they thought it was dirty. She said, it embarrasses me as a woman to know that there are women who are not registered to vote. If we want to get anything done, the surest way is with our voting power. She said, if anything is wrong, it's women's fault. We outnumber men and we could outvote them. Margaret said, you know men are scared to death that we are going to find out how strong we are. They say a woman doesn't stand a chance. Well, if we don't stand a chance, why did they try so hard to talk me out of running? Harper stated her belief that women's voting habits have relegated themselves to the position of a minority. Harper, who had led a number of women's organizations throughout the state said, I've been to Raleigh with these organizations to plead with legislators for better mental health programs, better libraries, better educational opportunities. They pat you on the head and agree. And then that's the last you hear about it. A woman in public office can hold them to some of these things. And that's why I'm running. I'm trying to do something that women need badly. So put a woman in high office in the state. She said, by refusing to act politically, we are engaging in political action. By remaining detached, we implicitly give our support to the status quo. It results in making us conspirators in what is wrong. We are perpetuating the ills. Women must be liberated from themselves and realize their own self-worth. We must run for public office ourselves or support women who will. If there are things we do not like, it is our own fault and no one else's. So I have to say, I used all these great pictures of women protesting, even though Harper said time and again that while she supported the views of the women's liberation movement, she didn't approve of their tactics. Instead, she believed women could change things by running for office and voting. But I think the two were tied together to produce change, and the protest marches were part of what raised the national awareness of women's concerns. It was part of what encouraged women to get involved, to register to vote, and to run for office. But I don't want to imply that, that Harper approved of all that protesting. Harper campaigned hard in 1972, perhaps even harder than she had in 1968. Although the campaign was nearly entirely self-funded, she did benefit from some grassroots funding. Women across the state held bake sales to raise money for Margaret's campaign. These unconventional female fundraisers had the added advantage of getting her more publicity. Due to the intensity of the race, Harper even used some of the money to run statewide television ads, an approach she had not used in her first campaign. But despite these efforts, the Harpers were completely outspent by two of the other candidates who each raised a quarter of a million dollars. It's the equivalent of one and a half million dollars in today's money. Harper called for a limit to campaign spending to make it a more equitable race, but it fell on deaf ears. Harper pushed to get the other candidates to speak out on the issues and engage in meaningful discourse. She said all this talk of motherhood and apple pie was not enough. They had to actually do something. 
She was outspoken in her belief that with the change of the lieutenant governor position to a full-time role, the responsibility should change. She believed it should have a stronger role in the executive branch, acting as a sort of ombudsperson that could make state agencies respond more quickly to individual problems of the people. She also felt that the Senate should be more self-governed and structure their own committees. She'd hoped that voicing these opinions would put her opponents on the hot seat and force them to take a stand, but they just ignored her and refused to take up the challenge. Margaret's husband, Jim, did all that he could to be a supportive political spouse. He even went so far as to attend formal teas and other events that were set up for the candidates' wives. With Jim and Margaret both having been in the newspaper business, they knew that his attendance at such events would be catnip for the press and garner them more publicity. Despite all of the concerted effort put forth by Harper and her team, she did not win her 1972 bid. This time, she came in third, behind the two men who had so grossly outspent her. In interviews following the loss, Harper expressed frustration. She said, people are not interested in whether women are in government or not. I don't think a lot of women voted at all. They didn't show any muscle at all this time. If they had wanted a woman, they would have put a woman in. There's nothing that makes me think that women got out and voted. It's kind of bad to knock yourself out trying to do something for women and then have them vote for a man. We work really hard to get women involved and the great majority of them are apathetic. In later years, Harper viewed her loss a little more philosophically. She said, the best thing I ever did was to lose. Back in the 60s, as a woman, they wouldn't have let me do anything if I had one. Instead of winning, I went on and was on various boards and commissions, which was probably a bunch more helpful than anything I would have done as Lieutenant Governor. Geraldine Ferraro once said, Every time a woman runs, women win. I think Margaret would have agreed with her. Although she didn't win her bid for nomination, she did accomplish her goal of getting more women interested in politics. Several women followed her example and ran for North Carolina office in 1972. Over the years, women have increasingly taken on leadership roles in the state legislature. Currently 25% of North Carolina state legislators are women, which is lower than the national average, but higher than the average for the South. With her 1968 and 1972 campaigns, Mrs. Harper was truly a woman who was ahead of her time. Several North Carolina women would go on to break the glass ceiling that she fought to shatter, but would be, it would be decades later. In 1992, Eva Clayton became the first African-American Congresswoman for North Carolina. In 2003, Elizabeth Dole became the first female Senator from North Carolina. In 2001, Beverly Perdue became the first woman to win the position that Margaret Harper pursued, 2001. She served two terms as Lieutenant Governor and then one term as the first woman governor in North Carolina from 2009 to 2013. And in 1997, Elaine Marshall became the first female Secretary of State, a position she still holds to this day. Secretary Marshall was only 23 years old when Mrs. Harper first ran for Lieutenant Governor in 1968. Marshall has said that Harper's campaigns were inspirational to her and encouraged her own run for public office. So I could talk for another hour about all the things that Margaret Harper was involved in and what she accomplished in her life in the nearly 40 years following her candidacy, but instead I'm going to leave you with some of her words. Now, I wouldn't presume to say what Margaret would think about the current election that we are in or which side she'd be on. But I do think it's safe to say what advice she would give to any of us, no matter our political party, if she were here. If there are things we do not like, it's our own fault and no one else's. If we want to get anything done, the surest way is with our voting power. And lastly, this is from a newspaper ad from 1968, but it is as true today as it was then. Vote first. Your freedom to choose your own political leaders through your vote is one of the greatest privileges enjoyed by mankind today. So vote for the candidate of your choice, but please vote. So I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about Margaret Harper and that you'll think about her the next time you are in the Southport Library.